Hey you. Yeah, you. Are you a dungeon and or a dragon? Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Elder Goblin Games, where the games are made up and the points don't matter. That's right, just like the first draft of your debut novel, all of this is subject to change. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about the best, worst GM advice. Who's to say? Was he a good dog? Who's to say? I pulled tens of ten of my friends and came up with the top 13 best GM advice that you're going to hear on the internet today. So without further ado, let's get started. Number one, split the party. As often as you can, it's a good idea to go ahead and split up the party. This will cause you to be effectively running two games at the same time, with some players sitting off to the side every now and then, but that's fine. They can wait while they watch their friends go through a traumatic, cinematic, other attic event. No one told me there was hair on my mic. Filled with lots of daring deeds and, dare I say, consequences. But I'm sure they'll thank you later for the exciting development that was everything that happened while they were off screen. Number two, all RP all the time. Get those metagamers out of here. It's time for role playing. As soon as your players come in the door, force them to hand their cell phones over to you and turn on their special funny voices. There's no outside world when it comes to our game. There's nothing else. There's only the dungeon. There's only the dragon. If you're not talking in your character voice, you're losing HP constantly. This is roleplay do or die. Number three. This may be a bit controversial, but your GM should be in control of all player arcs and major choices that the player characters have to make. I don't think anything more needs to be said about that, and your players definitely don't get a say. Number four, over prep whenever possible. For every, let's say, one hour of gameplay, there should be about 10 hours of prep time. You can never be too prepared. In fact, I'm going to sneak in number five right here and say, prepare for every possible scenario conceivable. Think about who your players are and the choices they might possibly make, the ones that you do allow. And think of a counter plan for those scenarios. You do want to thwart them at every possible chance. What are we on, six? I don't know, this is ridiculous. However, you do want to give your players plenty of opportunities for re-rolls, extra chances, and really consequences should be left to a minimum. Consequences, consequences, consequences aren't really that important. You can let your players make all kinds of choices, and as long as they're the choices that you wanted them to make, that's when the consequences come in. I have lost the thread completely. What are we on? Seven? These, <laughs> these suck. Sure, number seven. Don't explain any of the rules, and be overbearing and harsh whenever they do mess up a rule. You should always punish your players whenever they forget rules that you don't even remember yourself, and act like you did know them. Number eight, fudge the dice. If there's an outcome that you don't really like, just pretend that you rolled the number you wanted to roll. If you really needed to hit that player and take down their last death saving throw, it's time to say that you rolled a crit, even if you didn't. Oh, what's that? A player got through your trap way too easily? Well, make a roll on your side of the screen and suddenly there are six new goblins that appear. What was the roll? It doesn't matter, you fudged it. Number nine, be stingy with your boons and your loot. If players come up with creative ideas, don't necessarily give them anything. There's no reason your player needs a functional sword, a rope, a backpack, armor. These are all privileges that are not necessarily rewarded to the players at your table. Loot and things like boons for coming up with creative ideas should be limited. You should really bottleneck the flow of positive things that come at your players. You don't want to give them too much and make them overpowered because once they have it in their hands, there's no way to take it away from them. And also, you know, you're here to create a sense of realism in your game and at the table, not to cater to the whims of your chaotic little goblins. Which brings me to number 10. Hyper-realism first, fun dead last. The point of every tabletop role-playing game is that you create a hyper-realistic, simulationist-style game. Now, my friends, you're here to talk about the metric system. We're here to talk about distances. We're here to talk about the weight and mass of a medieval mace. We're here to think about things like food and water for the average human walking through a dense canopied forest. We're thinking about how much sleep you can realistically get while in a bed roll in the middle of a frozen tundra. Players love hyper-realism. They're not concerned about things like 
fun and character arcs. And getting to talk in five voices. No, they're here to do math. That's why we have math rocks. Number 11. You're going to want to put a GM PC somewhere in the party. This is a self-insert usually, maybe a character from a previous campaign that you, the GM, played, and you're going to want to put them in the party to make decisions and outshine the rest of the party members. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. This might get a little tedious after a while, but your players are dumb and they need clues. There's no better way to deliver them the clues to the story thread that you are writing than to use your own DM PC. This brings me to number 12, one of the most important ones on the list. Your campaign is your personal novel. This is the perfect way to test your own personal novel. That character concept, that villain you've been thinking about, the world you've created. I mean, in theory, those are all great things, but what better way to test it than to painstakingly, <coughs> excuse me, than to painstakingly force your party members to go through each and every arc of your story. Their choices are secondary to testing your own personal plot points and developing your story. Is this number 12? I have definitely lost the thread. Say no and yes but. No and, yes but, yes. Punish your player's curiosity. Whenever they ask for even the smallest thing, you should always say no. Just by default. And even if you do say yes, you want to say yes but... You're not going to quite get it the way that you think you will or want it. I know what you're thinking, but Jorben, isn't this going to really throttle play and bring your game to a grinding halt? Yes, it will. But that's fine. Remember, you're here to tell your story. You're here to create a world of realism. You're not here to do anything that's... This isn't a game, okay? Let's just get this out of the way. A lot of people come and play games like Dungeons & Dragons thinking... I'm here to role play. I'm here to have fun. No, we're here to create a simulationist world and live in it. What's the real world like? It's tedious. There are taxes. Why should your game be any different? It's really hard to say some of this with a straight face. Number 13, last and not least, let's say it together. Punish your player's curiosity. Yes. Every time your player reaches for that strange magical orb sitting in the center of a room glowing with a verdant light, it's time to deal 2d6 damage to them without a saving throw. Punish players' curiosity. Why are players always exploring the wilds? Why are they looking through your world with curiosity? It's because you don't punish them enough. I know earlier I said something about give your players plenty of chances and consequences, but you should probably just throw all that out because here's the real thing. If your players are curious, they're going to explore your world. And that means they're not going to follow the novel that you've written down. That means they're going to make their own character art choices. It's going to undermine the rest of the advice I've given to you so far. So remember, punish their curiosity. Okay, and that's it. 13 of the best advice you've ever heard on the internet coming from another neckbeard like me. I hope you guys have all enjoyed this video. Uh, I hope you saw the levity in it. Um... Truth is, I've probably done a lot of these at some point in my gaming career, so don't beat yourself up too much about it if they sound a little too on the nose. Uh, thanks, my players, for offering those great bits of advice. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Before we go, I do want to say, if you notice the frequency of my videos slowing down a bit, that's for good reason. As this is merely a hobby to me at this point, I have a lot of other things that require my attention and are my priority. And unfortunately, YouTube doesn't make any money for me, so... Right now, it is that, just a hobby, just like D&D or any of these other games you play. If there was one day I could make it into a career, that would be awesome, and I would do this much more frequently, but I'm not going anywhere, I'm just saying that my videos, frequency of videos might be slowing down a bit. But as always, I do appreciate you guys watching. If you want to see more from me, like and subscribe, share this video, maybe offer some topics you want to hear in the future, and I'll try to make videos about those. But until then, make mistakes, choose chaos, and most importantly, don't have fun. Yeah. I have scoured to the heart of the archives deep, and traveled to the top of the cinder cloud peaks, and forded the ever plains for the answers I seek. So beware of the realms where you meddle For the fates can be fickle 
when the dice settles.